Hello and welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Dimite, and I'm here with my good friends Brad Pieron and Aaron Richards. High five. And today we have a great <laughs> guest, Christine Kane. Yeah. Welcome to the show. You want to do a high five? Come we on, do that on the show. Yes. yes. For those of you who don't know, Chris uh, Kane is a like international preacher of the gospel, and she has a beautiful global. Mm-hmm. Uh, anti-trafficking ministry yeah. called A21. And uh, we're just, I'm really excited for you to be with us today, uh, Christine. Like, I find that you are one of the strongest, most prophetic voices in the church today, that you just have a powerful way to kind of open up the Word of God in a way that pierces hearts and sets hearts on fire at the same time. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm so honored. I, this is fun. Yeah. 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 So if you're joining us for the first time, we like to just take uh, our audience's questions, and then we each give a little bit of uh, our two cents on the answer to that question. And since we have a guest today, I'm going to give Christine my two cents. That's so big, boom. That's that's big, yeah. So you get to throw in your two cents today. And so Jack uh, are you ready to go? Can we have our question for the day? I am. The question for today is, how should we relate to people of other denominations? Yes. Mm-hmm. How Ooh. should we relate to people of other denominations? Uh, spoiler alert, if you didn't know, this is such a great question because uh, Christine is a Christian sister of ours and she's not Catholic. And yet you do so much ministry with all mm-hmm. these different people around the globe uh, yeah. on this very topic. So thanks so much for... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, toss my two cents in if that's all right, okay. Aaron, flip it oh, off! Dang it, Aaron, so every time. Uh, <laughs> that second one went off the okay, table. Okay, no, nobody saw it from the film, but those were so. Those are both. Those so were close. very close. Very close. I pride myself on being close. <laughs> All right, this is actually one of my favorite my favorite questions, and I, I want to lead us to scripture. So, in John chapter seventeen, Jesus in in one of the final moments of prayer that he prays before his passion, it's 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 on the night of his arrest, right? He prays in uh, seventeen twenty one. I pray for these. That I sorry, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. So he's praying not only for his disciples, but for all who would follow after them, that they may be all one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the context of John 17 is Jesus is praying for the unity of Christians. And uh, it's funny how we experience that in context of a, of a global church that's grown for 2,000 years and has suffered many moments of division. But this is said in anticipation, right? This is, <laughs> this is said in, in, in the reconciliation of relationship. Um, there are no denominations. There are no titles. This is, uh, the Christians aren't even calling themselves Christians yet, right? And uh, I, I love the, the connection that Jesus makes in this scripture that, that it's it's like the love of the Father and the Son that should unite Christians. And, and John Paul II famously said that the Holy Spirit is the person of love between the Father and the Son. I, uh, I think I, I could give a, a list of, of the what's to do to foster unity, and I'd rather push us more to the how. Mm-hmm. And, and the how happens only through relationship with a person. And I, I know I found in my own life that, that in engaging in deeper and more intentional relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's there that I've seen division fall. And it's there that I've seen the Lord um, manifest powerfully. I'd even, I'd even researched the history. You know, we have this lovely book, Lord Renew Your Wonders on the, on the table here. This is by a guy named Damien Stain. He looks through the history of the renewal and identifies that, yeah, in the, in the midst of the, the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, one of the you know, accusations that Catholics would actually would actually weigh on on the reformers was that um, there was a there was a, a breakdown of manifestation of the Holy Spirit that was brought about through division, and obviously we weren't there at the time, but the Catholics said, "Hey, this this Reformation is inauthentic because the Holy Spirit's not present." Flash forward to the future, in in nineteen hundred, uh, at the turn of the at the turn of the century, Pope. Uh, Leo the Thirteenth. He prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church, and where did the Holy Spirit pour Himself out? It was actually on the Protestants in T- in uh, Topeka, Kansas. I think mm-hmm. it was the it was the it was a Bethel Bible College that was this was the the birthplace of Pentecostalism, and and what we've seen today, I think that the the unity that we see in the church today and across denominations is because of our willingness to humble ourselves 
and to engage in relationship with the Holy Spirit first, that, that it's, it's through that unifying grace of the Holy Spirit that the Lord actually desires to bring unity to the church. Well, There's my two cents. That. <laughs> Sorry, that yeah. was a long two cents. That's a pretty no, good two cents. Awesome. That's a pretty good two cents. Yeah, you got your two that's cents. That's also kind of like a sure. mic drop. I did, yeah. I love the, I love this topic. Uh, it's it's completely transformed my life, and maybe I'll share that later in the show. But uh, I think it's yeah, it's when it's when we're willing to step into humility and engage in relationship deeply with the person of the Holy Spirit that we find that unity was His language from the beginning. Right. Well, it's also I mean the Holy Spirit. <laughs> as a person is wanting to form us into Jesus. Like yeah. the Holy Spirit's primary goal in our lives is to make us more like the one that we worship. And if he's making us more like Jesus, he's making us more whole, right? And and that's that's both at like the level of me, but also at the level of we here at this table. Like the Holy Spirit is, is a unifying person, right? Our God is a unifying God. And so, I, I mean, even just look very basically, Jesus is fully God and fully man. The Holy Spirit, like... <laughs> is bringing together God and man, right? And and if we're not all together, how can we have like how can we have the connection with God we were supposed to if we have brothers and sisters that aren't connected to us? Like we were made to be one so that we could come before God who's also one. I think it's interesting cuz if you think and I've never really thought about this until you said it Aaron, but if the areas where you see the most collaboration amongst denominations are in the spirit-filled arenas, if you will. Mm-hmm. Those who are alive in the Holy Spirit <laughs> often uh, the Holy Spirit is uniting us with our our brothers and sisters across denominations. It, just a quick note on that: it, it, it's regardless of mode of expression too. So when I my own experience of the Holy Spirit, you know, happened through sort of what you might expect through a charismatic, um, you know, through the charismatic lens. But you see unity in Christianity even through liturgical expressions or high liturgical expressions that are that are truly spirit centered. So a lot of times we'll talk here on the show about sort of comparing and contrasting a more traditional versus a more contemporary charismatic perspective. And I think the Holy Spirit, the person, transcends both, right? And can be powerfully present in both. And when you see the Holy Spirit present in both, you see you see unification. Hmm. I love that. I'm actually thinking in my own personal experience. When I was at school, um, so now we're talking in the 1980s, I think most people like watching this were not even born there. So um, <laughs> this is back when the dinosaurs still were. Actually, none of us were born okay. in the 1980s. No, no, you weren't? Well, in the 80s, but 80s. not in, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you're saying like we were just born. But um, so it was, I was, uh, I'm Greek, so I grew up yeah. in a Greek Orthodox church and I went to school and in our schools you were only allowed to go there in Australia. There was a compulsory religious education. So you you had to go to Protestant or Catholic. And because I was Greek Orthodox, um, I had to go to Catholic, which was mm-hmm. awesome. And so it was um, through uh, – there was a, a woman and then there was also a, a school teacher who was Catholic, and it was through them that I was introduced to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The charismatic uh, Catholic renewal was happening through Australia in the 1980s before you were born. And um, the Lord really – touch my life in such a a profound way, which I say all that to go, um, it doesn't seem that the Holy Spirit cares as much about denomination. He was willing mm. to come through a Catholic to a Greek Orthodox yeah. and say, you know what, I might, yep. I might just mm. touch you and mm. um, that unity. And I see that where I travel and minister all over the world, uh, that it is truly the Holy Spirit, it's not like he stands at the door and says, what denomination are you? And I'm going to touch you only if you're from a particular denomination. So I think the unity that we see around the world um, and just, it, you know, it is the beauty. I, I was then in my bedroom and I'd had that encounter. With, I'd had that experience with some of my Catholic school teachers and I went to my um, bedroom and I knelt on the floor and so I was 18 years old. You know, I'm just a kid at school before you were born. And so I was then, um, and I had this powerful encounter that to this day, so that was now almost 40 years ago, 39 years ago, mm. and so in Sydney, Australia. And I mean, I'm mm. here in the epicenter of the universe in Ohio somewhere. <laughs> I don't exactly know where I am. It's a very popular place. It's a very popular place. Everyone comes to Centerburg. Everybody comes here. Did you know that Ohio is the heart of it all? <laughs> the heart of it. People tell me that, you know, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of ministry, London, Paris, Munich, but they mm-hmm. said you have not. Seen Centerburg, Ohio yet. <laughs> yeah, at that point, everyone told me my life. Hey, I'll tell you what, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and the popular 
population of Bethlehem is larger than the population <laughs> of Cinderberg. <laughs> All right, Brad, you got two cents? Yeah, I do. Come on, let's uh, see what you I'm got. I'm not going to flip them in there. I'm just going to stand up. And then, oh, oh, I still geez. missed one. Um, I t- with four microphones. No, I'm just, I, I just missed, I think. Um, I've been thinking about this since you started talking, Aaron, and I, I don't know if I have the the best answer practically, but I want to try to give a practical response and say that I think that in my life where I have found the breakdown of division is in dialogue because division, meaning two visions, two different ways of seeing things, dialogue, meaning uh, two logics, two concepts, two thoughts coming together. And I think, I, I think about it even in the context of marriage, right? Like whenever my wife and I have two different visions of something, it's dialogue that breaks that down and sees, how are you seeing? How am I seeing? Why are we seeing it like that? And then what might we actually be seeing? And I, and without that, I think that we do fall into this individual lens. Like we were made not for just our own lens, but a lens of a church that, that God never made <laughs> the Christian people designed to be individuals. He made us designed to be one, to be together, to be the body of Christ on earth, to, to, manifest him in all of the ways that he desires to reveal himself to the world. And so I think whenever I am considering my own life with being from Southern Ohio, the beginning of the Bible belt, like there weren't a lot of Catholics in the area I grew up in. Almost everyone was Protestant. I remember growing up thinking that that was actually like two like (laughs) different, almost like entirely different faiths, not like strands of the same belief. Like I remember having conversations with my Protestant friends that would be like, but you're Catholic, right? So you're not Christian. I'm like, no, that's not, no, I I'm pretty sure you're wrong, but I don't know how to have this conversation. I didn't, I wasn't prepared to have a dialogue. I didn't, um, yet know fully what I was even believing. So when I came, I didn't come with the thoughts that I had. So I think there's, there's a two, um, pronged idea I have here, which is first come to understand who you believe God to be, have a relationship with him. And then find others who have relationship with him and then have a conversation because what that'll do is it'll reveal new parts of him to you and new parts of him to them. And, um, in my experience, like I, I with Catholics were baptized as babies oftentimes. Right. And I say the two most important days in the Catholic's life is the day they're baptized and the day they find out why it just took me 20 years to find out why in my own circumstance. But like, um, that date from that date forward, just going back and having Bible study with my friends from high school that are pastoring Protestant churches down that way. They were amazed that I knew scripture. They were, they were amazed that, and, and all of a sudden they were like, wait, but what do you think about that particular passage? And why do you think it that way? And do you want to come actually preach at one of our services? We would love to have you come, come speak and just say exactly what you just did. That's all. It's like, we would love that to be a message. So I think that when we come to understand what we believe and we, surround ourselves by other believers and we begin having conversations about what they think and uh, have enough, well, I guess that's an additional two cents, but having enough trust in our, uh, and confidence in our own identity to come there and be able to learn, you know, like not thinking that I have to go there and win, but go there and learn. A disciple means learner. I want to be a lifelong disciple, which means I want to be a lifelong learner. I think that's probably the most appropriate way to approach any conversation between denominations. That's pretty good. I really, uh, if, if we marry your two thoughts, I think it's, that's what I've seen personally when things go so, like, so it's, um, when I'm able to enter into spirit filled prayer with my Christian brothers and sisters, um, that's what opens dialogue, right? Mm-hmm. It's the, mm-hmm. that we we're, we're together, we're united in one in the spirit, we're united in the spirit. And we, we discover that there's, there's unity. This is real. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. actual real unity here. Mm-hmm. It's not make believe. And honestly, sometimes in, in prayer, I feel more union with, with Protestant <laughs> brothers and sisters, because there's just like, man, like there's just something there. And then that's what opens up the dialogue mm-hmm, that it doesn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we fail when we start with like, let's, let's get in a conversation and we, it almost becomes a debate as right. opposed to dialogue. And, uh, and so I, I have found prayer unlocks really mm-hmm. healthy interdenominational dialogue yeah. that like, Hey, we're brothers and sisters. When <laughs> brothers and sisters have disagreements, they can, 
they can talk to each other because they know that that disagreement's rooted in love. And and when they have their identity in the right place, they're unoffendable in the conversation, mm -hmm. which allows you to build trust over time. It's like, I tell me where it is that you think we're, we're in a different place here. Cause I'd love to hear, cause I still want to be in a relationship with you. I want to love you. I don't love you cause you're like me. There's parts of me. I don't even know. I'm learning how to love parts of me. And I love parts of you that are different than yeah. me, not just the ones that are the same as me. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, I completely agree. And I think you discover that a lot of it is just semantic to be honest. Um, and I, it, like, so once you get up close and personal and you talk, you just go, okay, we're actually talking about the same thing. We just talk about that same thing differently, but it's actually mm -hmm. more often than not in many areas so and um, very, very similar. And some of the other things that maybe, um, you know, we either do or don't agree on, it, they're much more secondary. The primary thing that has brought us to unity is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, coming back again, um, the the fullness of the, a, a triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that there is no other name by which man can be saved but Jesus. We're like, we all agree? Awesome! <laughs> awesome! <laughs> awesome! And everything Let's else. go spread that news. Yeah, I don't even agree with myself on half the other stuff. Yeah. I don't even agree with half the Protestants <laughs> on a whole lot of other stuff. So why would I agree <laughs> on secondary issues? You know, like, yeah. that's what I, and it's, I think the sad thing is that, um, when we've allowed those to polarize us, when you go, hang on a minute, the actual gospel, Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, coming back again, the only way to salvation, we're all on the same page. And we all, who knows, we're all going to get to heaven and find out we're all wrong about something. Somewhere along the way, that's sort of secondary. So I actually think yeah. that's um, that's what helps healthy dialogue. I, I love, we, we had a, a show a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about just the 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 uh, the impact of, in that case, sin in the world, right? And I think sometimes we forget about the impact of the reality that we make a declaration of faith like that. Right. That you you can't uh, overstate the fact that, yeah, we, we come into agreement based on our agreement around the fundamental mystery of yes. all of <clears throat> everything, right? The, the Trinity, mm -hmm. the triune God, and, and, and the person of Jesus himself, right? That you could spend a lifetime just breaking that open. And we tend to just gloss over that little thing so that we can focus on something much more minute. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but man, yeah, there's, there's so much power there. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to, like, as a Christian people, I don't want to form an identity out of condemning an out group. I, I want to I I form an identity about loving an in group. They're like, the gospel is come and see and follow me. I mean, that's, that's, that's the proclamation of, of Jesus. He's like, mm -hmm. come and see. Like, come and see. And I, I want to go out and tell everyone, come and see. Come and see what I think. Come, come and see how we worship. And let's have conversation about it. Let, can I come and see how you worship? Can, I would love to have a conversation about it. Like, let's let's create in-groups. Like, we can get, man, this drives me crazy in the Christian world, is we can get so obsessed with condemning out-groups or people that are different instead of creating a loving in-group where it's like, no, come as you are. And then let's, let's figure it out. Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life. The Holy Spirit wants to turn you into Christ. Why? Because you'll live the most fulfilling life you could ever imagine. You're going to live a life of adventure, a life that's not certain in the one sense, but absolutely certain in another sense. And like, I think when we can begin again, looking at the church as family, and it's something we want everyone to be a part of instead of, well, I want to create my tribe over here so that at the end of the day, I can mark myself as right. I think if we can avoid that, <laughs> we would be in a much better place. I yeah, do but Brad, think so. we are right. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right, Chris, you want to throw your two cents in? Are you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm new to this game. Yeah, yeah but yeah. you're going to make them both, and Darren and I embarrass <laughs> so ourselves. You don't have to throw them. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> and I'm supposed to say something about this. Look, I, yeah, I'm now you learning the everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was the question, Jack? What was the question? Uh, yeah, reiterate it to us. <laughs> oh, he wasn't ready. <laughs> Jack and his new ba car. Jack's not used to the second time. I'm not. I'm only a one-shot pony. Come on, Jack. <laughs> okay. Dan Damite. How should we relate to other people, people of other denominations? Yeah, I, I just, how should we relate to people of other denominations is how we should relate to everybody kindly. <laughs> that would be the start uh, nicely. I mean, and even, and especially if you feel that you're, you're actually right, then, then, you should have more confidence and grace to show the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So mm. I would say, you know, love, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Um, there are, of course, there are things that are important. Um, 
And, you know, you see even in, in, in the book of Acts, you see people and the apostles would come alongside and say, okay, we're going to work gently and kind of bring, I don't know anybody that's changed their mind on anything because somebody has been yelling at them or pointing a finger or judging them. Um, my children, that's not a great way to parent my children. <laughs> that's, it doesn't work in my marriage, you know, no matter how much I try to change my husband, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. So I think that if we, remember that Jesus said, by this will all men know we are his disciples, by the love we have one for another. That means, I'm not saying certain things are not important and need to be addressed, absolutely, but it is never okay to not address them in love. Mm. And we don't need to, um, you know, sometimes in the name of love we throw out truth and that doesn't work. You don't throw out truth in the name of love, but you also um, make sure that you don't throw out love in the name of truth. So you just go mm. to two extremes. And so then you have people yelling at each other. And to me, is what does that mean for our witness to an unchurched world? Like, so people that are not followers of Jesus, they have no idea of the nuances of, mm -hmm. you know, the canon and, and or, or many, and, and nor does it matter in light of Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, coming back, I keep coming back to that. But there are discussions that of course we need to have, but never anywhere in scripture would it say it is okay to have them with anything but a spirit of love or grace or compassion or kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I love that. That was a mic drop as well. I think that even like, how do you relate to people of other denominations? Honestly, for, for, for Catholics, I, I think sometimes it's just simply saying, go relate to people of other denominations. There, there is no relationship. And so if there is no relationship, there's no love. And if there's mm -hmm. no love, then there's no, there's no one baptism. No, <laughs> like, exactly. like there's no family. Yeah. And so it's that need to just build relationship, have, have a really healthy human relationship with the person. I love that. Yeah. Also, I think we have to appreciate the 90% that we have in common to have the conversation about the 10% we don't. Yeah. And so the moment you're not appreciating the fact that we are all on it's this great. amazing journey with the Lord, then, then you, you haven't really brought yourself to earn the right to have that conversation totally. on the 10%. And because like you were saying, Christine, I think it's, those things matter. And, and of course they do because truth matters. And love matters because in the in these three and the greatest of these is love. That's what that's what will remain. And so I think once we can begin appreciating and really loving the things we have in common, that's when real dialogue around the things that we don't happen. I have found too the things in common, like your work with A twenty one and stopping human trafficking in the modern world. It's like when when you're doing that kind of work with other christians it's just like oh yeah like we're i think when we're in the mission field together we're so united it's when we're in the classroom that we're divided and so i i mean we we fit in the mission field best as christians that's where we belong and that's i feel like that that we fit in the prayer room that's where we relate in the mission field that's where we relate really yes, well very much so that's a good word dan i'm <laughs> I'm I'm ready for. All right, mission. I'm gonna throw a question though. I do I do want to do the mission momentum. But I do have a question, Christine. We, you have a different perspective than the three of us. We're we're American Catholics, and you've been a like kind of more of a global Christian. And what do you? It's a really fancy title. Yeah. What do you, What do you see? Like I mean, it's my own denomination. Well, no, because, yeah. Well, no, because we I I've often like I interpret things through the lens of an American Catholic. Sometimes it's even hard, even from a universal Catholic, right? Because I'm right. not. I just see it from my American worldview. What do you do? You see a lot of divisions and factions globally amongst the Christians, or do you see like more unity happening? Yeah, I think um, the division. Um, and sort of a lot of the, uh, just kind of the schism that you see in America, in some other areas of the world, and I'll use this language, beggars can't be choosers. There's not enough Christians for us to really fight. Now, of course, you're always going to have the ones, but within the Protestant world, they're all fighting within each other. I'm sure there are factions within the Catholic world. I mean, I don't know, but oh, yeah. um, I yeah. guarantee there probably is because wherever there are people, there are factions. <laughs> but by and large, when I'm ministering in uh, Southeast Asia or Europe, um, or in Africa, or, you know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically as I'm talking to you about two recent trips to Asia and Europe. In the nations I was in, there was not, we were like, can you say Jesus? We're on the same side. You know, like, it's like, do you have, it's not, it, the luxury of division, isolation, mm. protection 
is when you actually are a more dominant force. But when you are a minority and you are, and again, this get, get comes back to your mission question, when you are about the father's business, mm -hmm. and I love that when Jesus said to his mother, look, <laughs> listen, didn't you know I have to be about the father's business? He knew that at 12. I wish we would get that yeah, revelation at 12. That. Like, yeah, <laughs> that if we're about the father's business, you really don't have that much time to get caught up in everyone else's business or to be divided about business because you're about the father's business to reconcile people to mm -hmm. him and to each other. And so I find that everyone's like, I'm so grateful you're a Jesus follower. No one's really asking. You know, I, the, I do so much in Italy and we work Protestant and Catholics together in so many different areas. I do so much in um, Greece and Bulgaria and Orthodox and, you know, uh, Protestants are working together. And, and no one actually even leads with I'm Protestant or I'm Orthodox. It's just I'm a Jesus follower. So, so, so mm. in some cases, yeah. we don't even know. We might be sitting at dinner and go, oh, I had no idea. And I go, oh, you know, I was in a Greek Orthodox church for 18 years. I married. My husband is number 14 of 15. You guys can guess what his parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, like, yeah, so, um, and I thank God for it. And so we work with, um, and again, Australian Catholicism, it's a little bit different to what it is over here. When I'm in Italy, it's a little bit different to here. But the, when I was in Qatar, um, working with Christians out of India, and there were there were Catholics, and there were Protestants, and there was like like just you were just grateful there was anyone, like seriously, and none of us we we were all um, respected one another's differences, and it was so secondary. It's fine, like mm -hmm. fine. That's not going to stop us from doing what the Lord's called us to do. Um, when I was in. Pakistan. I'm just kind of thinking it's like I could give you nations. We get so caught up here in a place yep. where we have so much privilege, so much power, so we can afford the luxury of like you stay on your side of the street, I'll stay on my side of the street. Um, and uh, But I think as America continues to become increasingly secularised, um, the rise of the nuns, and I would think that would be in Protestant and Catholic circles, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking around and going, do you love Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? Uh, let's work together yep. about the Father's business. So I think in those nations where secularisation uh, is just 10, 20 years ahead, like Australia, mm -hmm. like Europe, and then where America is, America's coming into that. So uh, desperation is a gift because it's going to bring us all to our knees and realize the main thing is the main thing. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, guys, let's transition to our mission momentum. We're going to share one way that we can carry this message into our missionary life this week. Who wants to start? Mm. I'd love to start. So uh, humble yourself. That's, that's, my, uh, that's my, my call. When I, I was in college, I was working in a, as a youth minister in a Catholic parish, and a lot of my experience of Catholicism early in my, in my high school and college days was really built around apologetics and truth-seeking, which was great. And I, I found at a certain point that it left me very empty and that I came to a place of realizing that I, had, I didn't have the fire and the drive to actually continue to be inspired for mission. And a major transition happened in my life. And actually, Christine, you, you played a big part in this. Uh, I was introduced through a friend to the Passion Conferences. Right. And as a, as a Catholic high school youth minister, started swallowing my pride and listening to the teachings of Lou Giglio and of Christine and of the other you know, individuals who were engaged in Passion. And I found that although we didn't agree on everything theologically or, or doctrinally, right, that wasn't what it was about. It was about me actually adopting a place of humility in order to be formed so that I might be stretched and have a greater capacity for love. So my invitation would be if, uh, if you find yourself authentically struggling because relationship is difficult uh, and you can do it in, either in the, in the quiet of your own room or you can get in your car and drive to the church down the street to take a deep breath, allow yourself to be humbled and engage in something intentionally that might make you uncomfortable. So uh, if, if you're the more traditional uh, Catholic bent, that's great. You know, engage intentionally mm -hmm. in, in a time of charismatic worship and prayer. Um, engage intentionally in uh, the teaching or, or, or preaching of a, of a non-denominational or, or a Protestant pastor. Um, and I, I would say the same thing goes on the other side. If, if you might be inclined toward being comfortable in your own little bubble of contemporary expression, maybe 
try to engage more deeply in someone who might, you know, have a, a, a high liturgical expression. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be amazed what can happen if you, if you humble yourself and take a step away from pride. It's good. Yeah, I have one. Um, it, it has similar elements, but I, I would encourage you to engage with someone you know you disagree with, but in something you both share. So like if there's someone at your workplace and you know that you guys have different political opinions or something like that, go watch a football game together because you go, you both love it and talk about that there and learn to love and appreciate the fact that they love and appreciate something you do. And then that'll open the opportunity for that dialogue. Maybe it's someone in your family. Think about someone even in your own church and, and go outside of yourself, find them in in knowing that you guys disagree, find something you share and engage in it with them this week. Yeah, I love it. Just off the back of that, I just think of my friendship with Sister Miriam. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, I think this probably speaks to both of your points. I was speaking down in Corpus Christi and her community was uh, mm -hmm. there. And I, I remember speaking, out, I was in a non-denominational church and suddenly I'm, I'm looking and there's there's two nuns. And so I, I know you find this hard to believe, but it did stick out in, in that room. <laughs> yeah, it, was yeah, like, okay. it was like, it really caught my eye and I was like so fired up. And then at the end of the night they came up and we just clicked. I mean, I'm talking like we just clicked right there and became, and this is now several, many years ago. And um, we just like FaceTimed her here yeah, before yeah. we started this podcast. And um, so the, here we were and we, with intentionality, when I was down in that part of Texas or she was in my part of California, we'd meet up for a coffee, we text frequently and um, we truly pray for each other. So she would mm. be one of my go-to people if I am coming into something and I really <clears throat> need prayer and I really need someone to stand in the gap for me, she is one of the first people that I think of. So that's I think so that beautiful. has a lot of power. Yeah. Love it. Plus be gone. Guys, thank you so much for listening to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. Christine, we're really honored to have you as a friend mm -hmm. and as a guest on our show I and speaking it. tonight at the Empower Conference. Uh, we're really blessed to buy your friendship. Thank you. Um, awesome. Hey, uh, remember, if this episode blesses you, please share it with a friend. Um, or if you think a friend could use this message, okay. share that with that friend as well. Um, and we will see you next week on Beyond Damascus, where mission, mission makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. Boom. Clean. You'll learn Strong. it. Strong. Mission time. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs>